welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our panel um, where we're going to get to meet our ocean. Um, this is the first in a whole series of panels about our ocean that we're doing around the month through the month of June, um, which is Ocean Month, or this is definitely Ocean Week. Yesterday was World Ocean Day, and so a lot of us have been um, celebrating the ocean. And um, I, I'm the State Director for Environment California. My name is Laura Dehan, and I am really thrilled to get to facilitate this very esteemed panel that we have who are going to be able to um, shed some light and um, help us understand more about what um, what there is out there in the in the deep ocean. Um, so I, I think of the ocean often in terms of the campaigns that we're running, um, protecting our ocean from, from threats, whether it's from oil drilling um, or from plastic pollution. And um, I know that I love the ocean and I want it to thrive, um, but I really don't actually know that much about what is happening um, when you get, you know, what you can find in there. Um, and so we thought it'd be really interesting to spend this month um, really learning a lot more about our ocean and a lot of the different ecosystems that are existing there. Um, and this particular one is gonna be focused in part on the geography of the ocean and the fact that there are these underwater mountains and also deep valleys that create all kinds of habitat for uh, wildlife. Um, so we're going to learn a lot about that. We're going to start in the, the deep part of the ocean and we're going to work our way up to the surface. Um, and so um, we're going to we've got some wonderful speakers um, who've been doing research and studying the, the wildlife and the, the habitats um, off of our coast. Um, the very first panelist is Jim Barry, um, who is a senior research scientist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And so um, the Monterey uh, Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay um, are uh, jewels here in California. We celebrate them so much. I got to take my very young children there um, over just a few months ago, um, over spring break, and uh, we just got to really enjoy um, you know, the beauty and the wonder there. And so I'm really excited to learn about what's in the depths of the ocean. So handing it over to you, Jim. Well, thanks a lot, Laura. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and get started on a little talk to give us a little bit of a tour. Um, so here we go. Hopefully you will now see the share. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. That's good, okay. Well, so my name is Jim Barry. I'm a scientist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Research Institute, and I'm a specialist in deep sea ecology. I study sort of how life is affected by the conditions in the deep and changes that uh, climate change and other things that are going on. Today, I'm going to talk about deep sea corals and some of the other mysteries around Davidson Seamount. And you can see this large map of the Earth here, and maybe people don't think about this much, but more than 60% of the Earth's surface is deep sea seafloor. And by deep sea, we usually mean something deeper than 200 meters deep. But on the map you're seeing here, most of that is around 4,000 to 5,000 meters deep. And you can see all sorts of ridges and trenches and mountains and such. And most of that is unexplored. Probably 95% or more people have certainly never seen. And if we look a little closer off our coast, um, Embari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, is located right at the head of Monterey Submarine Canyon, you can see here, which is as large as the Grand Canyon. It's wonderful, and we'll hear more about Deep Sea Canyons a little bit later. But today I'll talk about Davidson Seamount, which is an ocean, I'm sorry, a mountain sitting on the bottom of the ocean at about 4,000 meters deep in these deep blue colors. The top is at about 1,500 meters below the surface. So it's very steep-sided, craggy, and on the tops of this and all around, there's all kinds of life. And later I'll talk about this other spot at the base in the, some of the foothills called the Octopus Garden. Now, before we take a look at some of the things there, I wanted to give you a feel for what it's like. How do we study the deep sea? Well, we um, in Edinburgh use remotely operated submarines, either autonomous or remotely controlled. This one, the ROV Dock Ricketts, is an unmanned sub that goes down. It's controlled by pilots in the control room. We watch high definition video and I ask them to pick up that or go sample that. And we're all on the Western flyer here. And here's a quick time-lapse video showing us launching the dock rickets through the moon pool of our ship. 
And then going into the surface waters of the ocean, they're green because of the plankton bloom at the time of year this was taken. As you go down, all of that organic debris is sinking from the surface. It's called marine snow, and it feeds this midwater community of all these hatchet fish and fish in this case. And that marine snow sinks down to the seabed where it feeds the bottom. And here we are on top of something called Sir Ridge, not Davidson Seamount. So that's a quick blitzkrieg tour down to the bottom. And now that we're on the bottom, kind of imagine yourself out on a moonless night on a hillside you've never seen with a flashlight. That's what it's like using an ROV. You can't see the landscape. You can only see what's right in front of you. And so here are some of those beautiful corals that we see, bubblegum corals or bamboo corals. And these are one to two, or in some cases, up to three meters tall. And they are like the old growth forests that we have on land, like this sequoia forest up on the right corner here. They grow very slowly. The colonies that get to be a few feet tall are at least several hundred years old and maybe up to a thousand years old down at, at the Davidson Seamount. The oldest coral I know of that's been aged anywhere is was over 6,000 years old. So they can be very old, very slow growing, very sensitive to some human disturbances. Trawling can devastate these and they won't recover for centuries. Uh, deep sea sponges are also one element of these, these coral sponge forests that are, are so charismatic, so important. And they kind of interact with them in ways with corals in ways that I won't have, be able to explain now, but they sort of share food in a way. Now, I, here's a, I talked about that marine snow, and here's a video of a bamboo coral. You can see that marine snow sort of wafting by in the currents. There are strong currents sometimes in the deep sea. And these corals are trying to capture particles that are just the right size, just the right food content to make a living and grow slowly. In the background, you can see that white skeleton that's a calcium carbonate skeleton, much like you see in shallow water. But unlike shallow water corals that you see in the tropics, these have no symbiotic algae that photosynthesize and have a symbiotic relationship where they provide food for the coral. There's no light in the deep sea other than bioluminescence. It's dark, it's cold, and there um, isn't any photosynthesis. Now, in addition to the corals living there, they create habitat for other, other animals and organic debris that is part of the food web in the deep sea. And so they, there are many fisheries that are dependent upon some of these corals. All sorts of little animals live on top of these. Some chew on them and consume the corals. And so the corals are in a constant battle trying to prevent from themselves from being eaten, either through physical structures that prevent predators from crawling on or chemicals that they have in them that are distasteful. And in some cases, they're great habitat. Here you can see on the left, this bubblegum corals covered with basket stars that are up there themselves trying to capture particles in the, in the water column. Now, I'm gonna shift gears here and we're going to talk about another discovery that was just made only about four years ago. Um, some of the scientists here suggested that the Ocean Exploration Program explore these foothills at the base of uh, Davidson Seamount at about 3000 meters deep, where there are kind of interesting geologic features that had never been seen. They explored and they ran into aggregations of breeding octopuses, massive aggregations of hundreds to thousands of them. And they're in hydrothermal warm springs at the base of this extinct volcano. And so we have been studying these for a few years now. They're, these animals are about the size of a grapefruit and they're called Moose Octopus Robustus. They don't have a common name. And they I'll tell you a little bit about them. They were initially um, found in the 1990s by one specimen that was descri described for this animal. But now we've seen them at whale falls. You can see lots of them crawling around on this whale fall where they're either eating some of the little tiny animals, the amphipods and crustaceans on the whale, or they're eating the whale tissue itself. But they are definitely keying in on this big food fall. And how do we study them? Well, I mentioned that we have some a nice map of the canyon here in Davidson Seamount. And I'm going to zoom in on this to the octopus's garden. You can see this little box and there's a little hillside. It's only a couple kilometers long. And that little gray area is the area that we've used this mapping system we attach to the ROV. It has a high resolution multi-beam map and a, a LIDAR mapping system and some stereo cameras so that we can get a great view of this. And so we can make a map like this one. It's about the size of a few football fields. The oranges are shallower and the blues are deeper. We get a great map. 
And I won't go into detail there why it's important, but here is, you can see how he's gone back and forth mowing the lawn. This is a photo mosaic of over 10,000 images that have been put together. And you look at it and you think, oh great, it's a big gray football field, what's the big deal? Well, if you zoom in, you can see there's great detail in this image where you can get down to see individual octopuses sitting there. All those little white dots are octopuses. And we wondered what the heck, and so we used some software, by the way, MATLAB scripts, de developing some image analysis techniques, and we identified just in this area over 7,000 octopuses sitting there. So we think there are over 20,000 in the area, which is by far the largest aggregation of octopuses known anywhere in the world. And no one knew about it until just recently because we haven't explored that much. Now, what are they doing there? In the deep sea, it is cold. The water is 1.6 degrees centigrade or around 35 degrees Fahrenheit. But in these warm springs, it's about 10 degrees warmer. And it's that warmth increases the metabolic rate of these cold-blooded animals. And instead of taking many years to brood their young and, and hatch their eggs, it only takes them about two years. And so there's probably a huge advantage for them. So that's just a quick glimpse of a couple things that we've been doing in the deep sea off California. And I just wanted to kind of make my last few comments about the ocean, ocean stewardship and how important the deep sea is. That, as I mentioned, the deep sea covers over 60% of Earth, but a very large percentage of it has never been explored. It's got undersea canyons, mountains, and plains that are inhabited by an amazing diversity of life. And many, if not most of its mysteries still remain undiscovered. And the deep sea, as well as the rest of the oceans, are not so vast that they're unaffected by human activities. And more than ever, we need thoughtful stewardship of the oceans to protect these natural resources and all the benefits that we receive from them for free. Thanks for your attention, and we'll kind of move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Jim. That was so wonderful and incredible to think it was only just discovered four years ago, the octopus garden. <laughs> so yes. um, amazing to think about how many more mysteries there are to be uncovered in the ocean. Um, so our next speaker is Mary Kami. Um, Mary, are you able to share your screen as well? Let's see if it will work. Um, and while you're working on that, I'll introduce you. We're so thrilled to have Mary today. Um, um, in addition to being the, uh, she's a, one of the scientists at the New York Aquarium, the director of the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, New York Seascape Program. Um, and she's also been leading the way to get more protection uh, for the Hudson Canyon. And so we're so especially excited to be hosting this webinar um, the day after um, the Biden administration announced a new designation of a, a, a new monument or a new uh, marine sanctuary um, off of the New York coast. So um, congratulations, Mary, on this new step. And we're so excited to learn more about why it's uh, going to be so worth protecting this place. Thank you. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes, clearly. Yes, you can. OK, great. OK, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, to speak with you guys, particularly this week on the eve uh, on on World Oceans Week, the day after World Oceans Day, it's really, really an exciting time, and I'm happy to take you to now to the other side of the continent and talk to you a little bit about what we are doing here on the eastern uh, side of the country to uh, explore, to study, and protect some of these absolutely amazing habitats um, that you know we're so fortunate to to have here. Um, so I, let me, I am the director of the New York Seascape Program. That's the Marine Conservation Program of the New York Aquarium and the Wildlife Conservation Society. And some of you may actually know of the, uh, of the, of the aquarium from uh, the Bronx Zoo, if you've heard of the Bronx Zoo. Um, we and Wildlife Conservation Society uh, oversees five parks in New York City, including the Bronx Zoo as well as the New York Aquarium, which you can see right here. Um, and that's where our program is based. But WCS, as uh, we're also known, uh, is no, has been doing wildlife conservation in 60 countries around the world. And we have marine programs in at least 20 of them, including now with right here in the New York seascape, right in our own uh, back, backyard uh, of New York City. And 
I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why and how this is such an amazing story and such an amazing place to be working. Having grown my, up my whole life here in, in, in New York, New York, on one side of the Hudson River or the other, and never quite knew how amazing these waters were. Um, so um, we created, this is a map of the New York seascape, okay? And for those of you who may not be as familiar with this part of the world, uh, New York City is right up here in the corner. I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but um, this is Long Island, actually the longest island in the lower continental U United States and the coast of New Jersey. And this is uh, this area here is called the New York Bight. These are some of the most, uh, uh, the, some of the busiest waters with human activity and also amazingly diverse. We have, uh, this is one of the most developed coastlines in the, in the world. And yet the wildlife here still in our waters it, it is, is absolutely astounding. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about one of, those, one of those places. Now, New York City, you think of it as a major metropolis full of, full, full of people, full of pollution, full of development culture, but just offshore, this is what it looks like. It's like a wilderness here, right? Um, it, it's it's a, blue, a, a blank blue canvas that's highly dynamic, but virtually, looks very hydro, uh, hydro, uh, homogeneous. If we could peel away the bottom of the, the, the surface of the ocean, this is what we might see. Now, the map I showed you before was a map that we did in conjunction with the National Geographic in order to help uh, New Yorkers visualize all the activity and all the wildlife here on our waters. This is the flip side of the map. Okay, and here we get trying to give people a, a bird's eye view of the diversity of life that occurs throughout the, the New York Bite from our tidal rivers all the way out to the edge of the continental shelf. And today we're going to focus out here, right here on these waters, the waters of the Hudson Canyon. Now, Jim was talking about the amazing work of uh, the amazing life on the seamounts. We're going in the opposite direction deep, deep, deep into the, into, into the valleys of the, uh, of the ocean. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why these habitats are so amazing and so special. So to zero in now even closer, the red circle here depicts the location of the Hudson Canyon, all right? Um, it, and it is an amazing place that I think probably, if I were to guess 1% of New Yorkers or New Jerseyites where I, where I grew up, know about this place, I'd be astounded, right? It is a, a, it's a, it's a secret treasure right in our midst. And so to help people understand what this place is like, because we don't have any photographs of the structure and the scale and the, and the, of the canyon, I'm sharing this photograph with you. Now, most of you probably recognize this place as the, as the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Right? And so what I'd like you to do as we start talking about the canyon, Hudson Canyon, is to picture this covered, filled in with lots of, of salty blue-green water. Because Hudson Canyon actually rivals the scale and the majesty of the Grand Canyon, but it's just buried deep within, uh, below the surface of the ocean. And so it's part of the reason why it's, it's still so mysterious. Now, actually, canyons are not that uncommon. They they, the, these red dots are all the known canyons or some, most of the known, many of the known canyons that uh, are occur along the continental shelf, all right? Uh, here, they depict in this study over 660 canyons. And yet the, the canyons themselves only account for about 2% of the area of the ocean. Despite that very small area, so much life, so much productivity is concentrated in these waters. So I'll just tell you a, just a little bit about how uh, these canyons are formed. And on the left-hand side, you're gonna see sort of a, uh, a graphic of the edge of the continental shelf. Now, canyons like Hudson Canyon actually excise, uh, in, uh, actually incise, they cut into the edge of the continental shelf and it can extend very far inland to almost the mouth of uh, terrestrial rivers. And then they go very far offshore into the depths and the abyss of the ocean, all right? And a canyon like Hudson Canyon actually is the drowned riverbed 
of the Hudson River. So back in the Pleistocene, when during the glacial period, all this area out here was ice. And when the and the 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 edge of the glaciers were actually coming very close to the edge of the continental shelf. When the glaciers melted, started to retreat, all that water had to go somewhere and it drowned the river bed of the uh, of the Hudson River. And so we call this the Hudson, Hudson South Shelf Valley. And this is actually where the Hudson Canyon begins. Now, it is an amazing place. It is actually the largest of the submarine canyons. There are many of them that dot the Atlantic coastline, 14 of them in the mid, 14 or 15 in the mid Atlantic. And Hudson Canyon is by far the largest of those canyons. Um, it is actually one of the largest submarine canyons in the world. Uh, it begins about 100 miles southeast of New York City, or, the, or as oftentimes we say, the Statue of Liberty. And then it's when it cuts into the edge of the, of the wall of the, uh, of the continental shelf, it, it can also extend 350 miles more, further offshore. The walls can reach over 3,500 3, feet in height. And at the steepest point, it's about two miles below the surface, and it's the widest point about seven miles wide. All right, so it is like the Grand Canyon, just un buried underwater. And in this space, this place is home to hundreds and of, of marine species of all shapes and sizes. Some of them are bizarre looking, some of them are highly endangered, some of them are really important to fisheries, etc. cetera. Um, canyons in general tend to be ecological hotspots. And part of the reason has to do with the, well, there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of things that contribute to that factor. And, and Jim actually uh, addressed some of them in talking about uh, about the seamounts, but these are highly complex structures, often very fragile. Uh, they, the, the geology, the how it is formed, the nature of the of the of the mo uh, water patterns and currents, thermal differences that create tremendous amount of upwelling, currents that bring lots of nutrients from the continent to the shelf and. And as, as Jim pointed out, a drop is snow to the bottom of the canyon to feed you know, all kinds of other creatures. All these things contribute to uh, the biodiversity and the abundance of wildlife that occur in the canyons. So part of our job is to try to help, to help people understand why is this such a special place? And we don't, it, the, we don't, we're still exploring these places. We don't really know much about them and we can't, for the average person, visit them. So we have worked with an underwater photographer because um, as the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so we have gone, worked with a photographer to help capture some of a, a minute uh, amount of the biodiversity there. And so I'm gonna share with you some of those images. Um, and these also come from some of the dives that uh, Jim has talked about in the work of other scientists working with the uh, with NOAA, uh, our, the agency that oversees uh, our deep water explorations. And so, I'm just going to take you quickly on a tour of some of the some of these amazing creatures. I'm not going to talk to you about much about corals because J Jim did a great job, knows much more, did a much better job than I could. And so, um, just realize that there are cold water corals in many of the canyons. If I tell people here in New York that we have cat corals in our water, of course, they're thinking about tropical coral reefs. These are very different. These are deep uh, in the edges, the bottom and the walls of the canyon and are highly fragile, very old and uh, very important to helping to maintain some of the other biodiversity that I'll tell you about now. So starting at the bottom, there are many spe species that live at the bottom and the or in the walls of the canyon, uh, and these are just a few of them. You can see some of the uh, other species of octop uh, octopus that uh, Jim mentioned, and all kinds of brittle stars and 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 sea stars, mussels, um, and lots of different kinds of animals that I really love: the chondrichthyans, the cartilaginous fishes, like like skates, and here we have a chain dogfish. And, in, and even species that we're very familiar with, like American lobster, find spend some of their lifestyle, some of their lifetime in these canyons. Other species create habitat, like tailfish. 
that burrow into the canyons and many other species then use those burrows for shelter and for, uh, and, and for reproduction. I'm gonna take us now all the way to the surface. There are many species that live in, uh, in the canyon and depend upon uh, surface waters, including many kinds of seabirds. This is a Wilson's petrel that feeds uh, on all the detritus that sits at the surface. And there's fulmars and there's many different seabirds that spend almost their entire life out in the canyon and hardly ever touch ground. Marine mammals and other, that must come to the surface to breathe are also common in the canyon. There are more than a dozen species of dolphins uh, that ply the waters, as well as giant whales, uh, fin whales, and humpback whales, and some of the deepest diving whales uh, penetrate the, uh, the canyon, um, the sperm whales. So there are a number of uh, researchers here at WCS, uh, Howard Rosenbaum, as well as others at Stony Brook, et cetera, that are studying the ecology and how these animals use the canyon. We have at least three or four species of the, of, of the world's seven sea turtles here in New York, including loggerhead sea turtles and Kemp's Ridley's green turtles that spend their time, sorry about that, spend their time at the surface. And then uh, because they eat and feed uh, in, in the canyon. And then there are giant ocean fishes. This is one of the largest uh, fish, fish, bony fishes in the ocean, Mola Mola. It's an ocean sunfish that sometimes if you see it at the surface and you're out on the water, you can mistake its fin that cuts right through the top as, uh, as a shark. Uh, this animal is massive and yet largely just feeds on jellyfish, believe it or not. And then there are many species that are really important to fisheries. Um, include commercial and recreational fisheries. Here we uh, is a, a magnificent school of, of mackerel. Um, this may be familiar to some of you. It's a dolphin fish, but you may know it uh, from your dinner plate as a mahi-mahi. Brilliantly colored um, and supports a very, uh, very um, sort of sustainable fishery uh, out of the canyon. And one of the other really important species that supports our commercial fisheries are squid. We have two species of, of squid and they are prevalent throughout the water column, uh, even down to, the, down to the depths of the canyon and are uh, really the, probably the most important commercial fisheries that we have here. And then there are also the highly, uh, highly migratory species uh, that ply the entire water column to feed on, um, on other fishes and uh, higher up in the food chain, including the sailfish, bluefin tuna, and then some of my absolute favorites. Uh, we have uh, blue sharks and mako sharks, um, which we have been tagging to look at the movements of these animals and see how they depend on canyon ecosystems and the prevalent and the, and the, the gauntlet that they face in the fisheries that operate out there. Uh, and capture these animals uh, either intentionally or, or incidentally. So that's a whirlwind tour. You know, it's, uh, I'm so appreciative of having of the work with, with photographers and with NOAA and partners like that that can help us visualize the canyon for the public. But there are other resources of value or of interest in the canyon. And that includes oil and gas. Now, I know, Laura, you mentioned the concerns that you have about offshore oil and gas development, and we do as well. Um, there have been a number of uh, explorations of the canyon over the years uh, for oil and gas. There are a lot of methane seeps, and we, were very, we are very concerned about growing exploration and interest in, these, in, in, in development of oil and gas offshore. And that led us to, to, to actually suggesting that maybe this place deserves recognition as a, as a national marine sanctuary. In 2016, the Wildlife Conservation Society put together a proposal and pitched it to the National Marine Fisheries, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Office to make this a sanctuary. In 2017, after reviewing the materials, NOAA agreed and put this sanctuary into their inventory where it has been sitting for the last five years waiting for action. Now, a sanctuary is a multi-use space. It can support fisheries, it can support shipping, it can support ecotourism, and it is also meant to help protect uh, wildlife and cultural resources there. So part of our goals in, in asking for the, a canyon was these here. We want to very much exclude 
oil, gas, and mineral development. At the same time, we want to see that these rich ecological resources are protected, the wildlife and the habitats that they depend on. We are looking um, to the sanctuaries can enhance science, bring research dollars in, and facilitate monitoring. The canyon can serve as a sentinel to look to monitor what, ha what is happening in our waters in terms of climate change. And we see that it's a, in a very important role. It can also be a, 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 a living laboratory to, for education and greater awareness, it's STEM, uh, STEM outreach. And it also, we also believe that it can support ex economic uses like continued fisheries there, as long as they're sustainable. Well, the good news, as Laura hinted, is that after five years of waiting and a, and a, and a, and a campaign that we've been working on for, for well, almost 10 years, yesterday at the, uh, at the uh, Capital of the Oceans Week, the Biden administration said that they are taking our, our nomination out of their inventory and moving it into a very public designation process where everybody will have an opportunity, all of us, every stakeholder will have an opportunity to weigh in and say why they think the canyon should protect, be protected as a sanctuary, or maybe why not? And that process begins today. This is where you all come in. We need your help. We need the public to weigh in and support the, the call for the canyon. And there are all kinds of things that you can do. But starting yesterday and until August 8th, you can write letters, sign petitions, you can participate in the public hearings that NOAA's hosting. Uh, we need to tell everybody about these amazing places. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to our website where we have lots and lots of resources available to share, to share with friends, et cetera. We don't want you to be one of the people on the right-hand side of this slide that has no interest in the deep sea. We need advocates, we need people to, to stand up for our canyons and seamounts. And so I'm hoping that you can stand with us and support that work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary, that was wonderful. And it's very exciting to be, um, to get to learn more about this incredible place on earth um, that is now hopefully gonna get a lot more protection. Um, so the next speaker that we have is Arla O'Brien and, um, for this, uh, this is going to be all about um, life on the surface. So we spent a lot of time talking about life in the depths of the ocean, learning about the Hudson Canyon and kind of life in the middle of the ocean. Now we're going to go up to the surface. Our Arlo O'Brien is an associate scientist with the New England Aquarium and with the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. Um, and she's been doing a lot of research uh, based on the life that's coming to the surface. So over to you, Arla. And I think you have to go. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. So um, I'm an aerial survey biologist with New England Aquarium in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I'm going to talk about our aerial surveys of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. So just some basic facts. Um, the Marine National Monument was established in 2016. It's the only one of its kind um, in the Atlantic Ocean. The rest are in the Pacific. It's about the size of Connecticut and it's uh, 130 miles southeast of Cape Cod. The boundaries of the monument include three underwater canyons, which you just heard a lot about. Um, these are them here. And then also four seamounts, which you heard about as well previously. So our aerial survey started in 2017 and we fly just to the, the canyons unit of the monument. Um, and we've been flying, uh, like I said, for about five years to collect data on what kinds of marine mammals use the area. So I just wanna point out too that the New England Aquarium was part of a coalition that helped to designate the monument. Um, so this image is adapted from a bigger, um, uh, from a paper by scientists at New England Aquarium and Mystic Aquarium. So this shows uh, the final designation of the monument. And then the, the red and the more reddish shades show higher numbers of marine mammals. So you can see that all along the shelf edge are high numbers of marine mammal diversity. And this research is just part of what went into designating the monument. And I also just wanna point out that anywhere you see um, cross hatching, is an area where um, 
there was very little data collection and it just kind of shows that there's a lot more to be learned about the area, which is why we continue to fly out there. So just a little bit about what makes this area so diverse. Um, one reason is that the monument has a lot of habitat complexity at multiple scales. So it stretches from the shelf edge to the deep sea. And there's also a lot of different bottom types. Um, there's glacial till, there's uh, sandy bottom, there's more rocky environments. There's also local complexity due to the really steep slopes of the canyons and the seamounts. So water currents encounter these slopes and they create localized eddies and pockets of upwelling. Um, upwelling uh, brings nutrients up to the surface, which is gonna start primary productivity, um, which is gonna bring larger and larger organisms to feed. And so that's how you get animals as small as these dolphins and animals as large as these fin whales um, feeding together in the same environment. So we've been surveying the monument for almost five years, which means that we have seen a lot of really amazing things. And I want to share um, just some snippets of what we've seen with you. So I'll start off by talking about um, sperm whales because they're kind of the um, poster whales for offshore canyons. So sperm whales spend a lot of time out in the, uh, in the canyons because their main food source is squid. And there um, are a ton of squid in the canyons um, and the seamounts. So we tend to see sperm whales resting at the surface between dives. Uh, average dives for sperm whales are about a half a mile deep and can be almost an hour long. And uh, if you think that holding your breath for an hour is long, then you have not met a beaked whale. Um, Cuvier's beaked whales, uh, pictured on the left, are record dive hold, um, breath holders. So one Cuvier's whale was recorded on a dive that lasted almost four hours. So um, beaked whales are also squid eaters, just like the sperm whales but they're smaller and they're more cryptic. They're um, really hard to see and, and not, not a lot is known about them. We've seen three different species, the Cuvier's beaked whale on the left, the sour bees beaked whales on the right, and also true's beaked whales. And one of the things that I think is really fascinating, um, thinking about how long they can hold their breath for is when we see a group of say four beaked whales at the surface, how many more have to be down there that um, we're just never gonna see. Um, so we also see a lot of different types of dolphins. Some of the larger dolphins we see are pilot whales and Risso's dolphins. They're both social animals. They live in pods or family groups together and have um, really large melon-shaped heads. Um, both of these species, again, feed mostly on squid. Um, and something I think is kind of a neat story is that both of these species can coexist in the same environment, feeding on almost the same types of food because they're using just slightly different parts of their habitat and their environment. So pilot whales are a little bit bigger um, and they dive a little bit deeper, uh, anywhere between 1,500 to 3,000 feet or so. But the Risso's dolphins um, usually dive at their deepest to about 1500 feet. So they're staying above where pilot whales go. And so they're able to kind of use different, um, different parts of the environment. Uh, a much smaller oceanic dolphin we see uh, is a striped dolphin. So striped dolphins are usually found out at the shelf break or further off into um, really deep waters. And we generally see them in really big groups, so pods of 100 or more. Um, if there are any West Coast folk on, you might be familiar with striped dolphins because the shelf break in California, for instance, is much closer to shore. So you might be able to see these dolphins close to shore. But it's not something that we're used to seeing in New England. Um, and I had no idea that this dolphin even existed in the Atlantic until the first time I saw it at the monument. Um, Something else that was really shocking for me to see was um, seeing a blue whale in the monument. So again, West Coast folk might not think this is very unusual, but we just don't see blue whales in Massachusetts that often. So the story behind this is that um, we had been trying to do a winter flight for uh, a couple of years and it never really lined up. And then the first winter flight that we flew in February, 2020, we flew out there and we actually saw two different blue whales. Um, 
We also saw a bunch of other baleen whales that day. So fin whales, humpbacks, say whales, things like that, um, which we don't see that commonly either. So it seems like maybe the conditions were just right to um, bring in a lot of baleen whales. And just to give you an idea of how rare the blue whale sighting was, um, previous to these two blue whales, only one blue whale had been recorded in this area previously. So completely shifting gears, um, I know that mostly I talk about um, marine mammals, whales, and dolphins because that's my area of expertise, but we actually see some interesting fish out at the monument as well. So there are two types of oceanic rays um, or mobulid rays that we see. Uh, on the left is the giant manta ray, and on the right is a Chilean devil ray. And so people probably think of them as being more tropical type fish, but actually they come up here following Gulf Stream protrusions, uh, little eddies that kind of shift off from the Gulf Stream, and they come up here to feed, and you'll see them feeding near the surface. Uh, another animal that is doing the same thing following those Gulf Stream uh, protrusions of warm water is a whale shark. So um, they kind of come in, they take advantage of really temporary feeding conditions, and then they leave. So on this specific day, we actually saw four whale sharks in a really similar area. And again, you'll see them near the surface feeding. And we've actually seen them on uh, three different summers now, so uh, fairly consistently, which is really cool. So I do wanna bring it back a little bit to species diversity. And I just wanna share some of our more recent research with you and um, our monument flights contributed to this research. So we compared this canyons unit where we survey to 500 other ocean parcels um, on the uh, east coast of the same size. And we compared uh, marine mammal diversity in all of these. And we found that the monument placed in the top 2% of every metric of um, alpha diversity, um, meaning that it's one of the most diverse places for marine mammals along the East Coast, which is pretty cool. So I just wanna end by reinforcing why these areas are so important. So obviously protecting a place with high diversity means that you're protecting a lot of species. Um, from a research perspective, it's also really important to have areas free from human impact to be able to compare to other areas to see how they're kind of faring um, with climate change. So keeping protected areas for marine mammals and other species can also serve as a refuge for rare or more sensitive species, somewhere where they don't have to deal with human impacts. And it can also help make our ecosystems more resilient to large scale changes, which is just all going towards making for a healthier ocean. So, and um, with that, I just wanna say thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And I just wanna thank our primary funders of, um, of the aerial surveys. Wonderful, thank you so much, Orla. That is so fascinating that there's so many, so much wildlife, you know, and that you can see them from um, traveling right over the ocean. Um, so let's see, we're gonna have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and so if anybody has a question that you want to drop into the chat, you can do that now. Let me just, um, Let's see, I was gonna share my screen again, but maybe we can just keep it like this so we can see everyone. Um, so anyone who has a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. And I saw one question that came in was for Mary about the, um, the new um, designation of the sanctuary that's being considered right now at the Hudson Canyon. Um, is, could you tell us more about um, whether it's gonna allow commercial fishing and saltwater angling? and maybe more about why you were working toward this particular kind of protection uh, for that, that space, the Hudson Canyon. Yes, thanks. A, that is a great, great question. So National Marine Sanctuaries are multi-use, and many of them do allow for commercial and recreational fishing. Um, we chose to pursue a National Marine Sanctuary nomination because it is such a public process. It, it is very much stakeholder and community driven. Uh, there are lots of opportunities, including right now, for the public to weigh in. Um, our position has been that fishing, if sustainable, is and, and in, in these areas and in the mid-Atlantic, much of it is, are managed currently by 
the National Marine Fisheries Service, Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, as well as the Highly, Highly Migratory Species Division. Uh, we believe that fisheries can be maintained in the, in the, in the canyon uh, and under the current management structure. Now, that's not for us to decide. That is our recommendation. This will be a, a decision that uh, will be made as part of the designation process with all the uh, feedback that comes from the various stakeholders going forward. So that that's what we're that's where we believe, but you know we we don't have control in the, in the end. That will be up to Noah to decide. Great, thank you. Um, there was also a question for Jim, um, which I think you answered in the chat, chat partly, but I think it might be interesting for everyone um, around how do you actually do the mapping of the seafloor, um, and you know, are there do we know if there's any impacts on on that process on the ocean life? Uh, sure, it's a great question. The way we map the seabeds, I think one of the questions said, can we map using satellites? And the answer is, yes, you can map the seabed with satellites because of the, the changes in gravity that you get um, a sea surface that is deflected a little bit. And so when you see the deep sea surface deflected, it re represents the seabed to some extent. Very coarse map. If you want a high resolution map, you need to have some sort of acoustic device mounted on your ship or on a submarine that's underwater that's near the seabed. And so you transmit, you make a ping, just like you'd see in a movie, you know, it pings the bottom, that ping is reflected back and the receiver is listening and has a what's called a time gate on it. So it can, can measure how quickly some re returns come back. If it goes further, it takes longer to get a return back. If it's closer, it takes less time. And so you can construct a map based on the arrival times of those pings reflected off the seabed. And if you're in three or four kilometers of water, when you ping, it just like light goes out as a, the square of the distance, the ping spreads out as well. And so when it hits the seabed, it's the, the best resolution you can get is about a 20 meter square. So that's about as good as the resolution. You wouldn't see the, the, the corals behind me or the, or the chairs or table in your room, but you'll get a nice map. If you want a very high resolution map, I described this a little bit. We had a multi-beam system right on the ROV and flew that just three meters above the bottom. And with the same system you'd use on the ship, you can get a resolution down to between two and five centimeters per, mm. per pixel. So you could see your coffee cup on the table with a map that's that good, or the sponges or corals and whatever. So that's the kind of technology we use to make those maps. So fascinating. Um, I had a similar question for Orla, not about, well, actually about how you do your work <laughs> um, with, with the aerial um, photographs. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you go about capturing those images? I just, they were so fantastic and I just couldn't imagine being that close from above without making a lot of noise. And I um, was curious about how you do that and how you came about the, the techniques that you're using. Um, yeah, it's um, a good question. So we um, take our photographs with a um, digital SLR camera. So just like, you know, a really nice camera and we put a nice zoom lens on it. So the photographs that I was showing are taken with a 600 millimeter lens. So, um, you know, definitely a commercial scale lens that you probably wouldn't buy for yourself. Um, but basically when we're flying along, um, if one of us sees something, two of us are kind of in the back behind the pilots, then we fly over to it and then we'll kind of pinpoint where it is. And we basically just fly um, orbits around it. And um, we have like a little window that's like about the size of a piece of paper that pops open and you just stick the camera, you know, kind of right in the hole and um, take your photos. So it, it, it sounds simple, but it actually is hard to kind of line everything up to get the perfect photos. So um, yeah, those 20 photos are, you know, 20 of thousands of photos. <laughs> Got it, that makes sense. Um, really, really cool. Um, I, I just kept being struck by how many of, uh, how much of what each of you said is that, 
it was, you were really surprised to discover either this species or this incredible octopus garden. Um, and, you know, or just the fact that there even was a canyon out there you know, right close to where you had lived your whole life, Mary. Um, and so um, anyway, it's just really incredible. And I was wondering um, what is next? Like what's the top kind of research question or area that you guys want to explore that, that needs uh, attention? If, the, if there's any projects on the horizon that you could share, that'd be really great. And that's for anyone who wants to take it. Well, I'll say something quickly. I mean, we are continuing to look at deep sea corals. We've established something we call the Deep Sea Coral Observatory here. And we have put down time-lapse cameras because normally what you do in a subsea study is you get to visit once. So today we'll go down there for three hours and you'll get a view of what's going on. And then you may not see anything for some, come back a couple of years later. We've now developed a deep sea camera that can take a picture every hour of a, of a scene in front of us so that we can understand a little bit more about kind of what happens through time during the periods that we're not there. And that's just one um, in the coral um, area that we're working on. The octopuses, we're still trying to understand more about how they use these wonderful little hydrothermal springs as a habitat that benefits their population. Fascinating. Um, Larry, I can, yes, I, I can go. So we're, we want to keep exploring the biodiversity of, uh, of across the entire sea space. What's living out there? Where is it? When is it there? You know, the spatial and temporal distribution of life in our in our local waters, and including the Hudson Canyon. And one of the we're going to be employing a new, uh, a relatively new tools, getting uh, getting more and more popular, uh, and that's the use of environmental DNA. So rather than having to go out and trawl and or use hook and line to sample for for wildlife, you can actually go out and collect samples of water that in the water has just, a, it's like a soup of cells from all the species, all the animals, all the plants that have been there. And you can collect those and through very sophisticated uh, uh, genetic lab techniques, you can, we can actually create a library of the, of the biodiversity in, the, in these waters. And so we are about to start a project that is looking across the entire seascape out to the canyon, uh, across space and time to see Hmm, what, what vertebrates are living here and, how, and compare that to some, some of the more traditional sampling method, methods that we've been using to monitor wildlife. Oh my gosh, amazing. <laughs> it's so cool that you can do that. Um, and then Orla, did you have anything in, in mind that you're excited to do next? Um, yeah, I would just say, you know, from like a larger perspective of um, the New England Aquarium, I think that something that's really important is this um, 30 by 30 initiative. So protecting more of the world's oceans and wild places. And so um, we're interested in doing research that's gonna support that too. And so some of the species diversity um, images that I showed is contributing to that research, right? Although I wanna point out that we only looked at marine mammal species diversity, and there's a lot of species out there that need to be um, thought about when designating more protected areas. But um, I think that's a really good area to go forward in. Awesome. Um, yes, a lot more of the ocean will need to get protected if we're gonna to get to 30 by 30, which is that um, initiative by uh, President Biden, supported by President Biden, as well as here in California, Governor Newsom, um, who enacted an executive order and is really like a global effort to protect at least 30% of our land, water, ocean by 2030, on track to protecting ultimately half of our earth for wildlife and wilderness and nature. Um, and that's what we, we really need to get to if we want to restore the balance of nature on earth. Um, so we um, are excited for you to do that research so we can use it in our advocacy to help win that um, that goal. Um, and in the chat, um, everyone should see we have um, a hot off the press action in support of the new designation of a brand new marine sanctuary um, in the Hudson Canyon. Um, and so thank you so much to um, everyone for joining us today and for our um, speakers, our wonderful speakers. We're so excited to share your fantastic research. And I wanted to 
ask every single person who's on the Zoom, if you can click the action um, right now and um, send a strong message um, to, um, to the Biden administration, urging them to really um, support this, this protection um, for this incredible place, the Hudson Canyon, um, and more and more of our sea spaces. So um, thank you everyone again for joining. Um, after this, we're gonna send out um, uh, kind of notes from, from the event and the link to the, um, the Facebook live stream so you can check it out or share it with other people. Um, and we hope that you'll uh, join us for another one. This is only the first in a whole series of these webinars. And so we're gonna have um, a few others. And actually that's another link we should, we'll, we'll send out in the email so you can sign up if you, um, if you haven't had a chance to do so and learn about um, kelp forests and coral and other terrific um, things about life in our ocean. So thank you so much.